Hi, everyone. We'll give it a minute just to make sure everyone can join the Zoom link. Okay. Looks like we can go ahead and get started. And if a few people start keep coming in, all the better. Uh, welcome to FactGrid Cuneiform, a linked open data wiki base for contextualizing ancient inscriptions. I'll be introducing our speaker, Adam, in just a moment. Um, I know many of you have seen this slide throughout the conference, but just a reminder um, that we have a conference website URL posted here, our code of conduct, the Twitter uh, account and hashtag, our Slack invite and tech support information if you run into any trouble and need to um, ask for some tech support, you can do so in Slack, and a link to the LD4 2022 YouTube videos. I will post these in the chat in just a moment. Um, reminder that this session is being recorded and will be available on the YouTube channel um, either later today or sometimes very soon. Um, we are joined by Adam G. Anderson. Uh, who received his PhD at Harvard in Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations in 2018, followed by a postdoc at UC Berkeley in Digital Humanities at Berkeley, where he co-authored and designed the curriculum for the Digital Humanities minor and certificate program. Adam's current work includes the development of linked open data resources for the field of Assyriology and its archaeological context in the Middle East. Thank you so much, Adam. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and you can get started. Great, thank you. All right, is that um, visible? <laughs> yes, cool. Okay, so um, as uh, as I noted in the in the abstract, um, I'll be talking about um, some of the kind of ontological background for that I'm using within Wikidata for linking uh, this data that uh, revolves around these tablets that you see here. Um, there's already um, a, quite a, a large framework for linking the numerous features of an inscribed artifact, such as a cuneiform tablet, um, and contextualizing these objects both spatially and temporally. However, as of yet, there are no properties in place for recording scribal variations at the level of each individual sign on the tablet. <clears throat> so to address the growing need for linking lexical data at the most granular level, this presentation will discuss an implementation of um, a wiki base um, through FactGrid uh, and, and some extensions that were making for linking distinctive features of a cuneiform tablet uh, to the existing lexicographical standards in Wikidata uh, onto Lex Lemon. So um, this is the um, fact grid uh, wiki base that we have built so far. Um, and it currently consists of all the archeological excavations where cuneiform tablets, <clears throat> excuse me, artifacts have been found. Um, but um, before we can link the data, we first need to build a comprehensive ontology, which is what I hope to present here today. I've given aspects of this, maybe um, different aspects in other talks you can find online um, having to do with fact grid, but um, yeah, I'll get into the details of linked data, uh, especially here. So before I jump in, there's um, a, a number of people I'm collaborating with this uh, project. I, I don't want to appear to be this sole researcher. This is definitely uh, collaborative work with um, numerous institutions around the world, um, uh, numerous databases um, that house the, the tablets in published online um, open source uh, databases. There are over 350,000 cuneiform tablets published online. These are just a few of those databases. Um, the ones that were 
actively engaged with, I suppose, um, but there are at least uh, 20 plus other databases out there. So there's a wealth of cuneiform data, believe it or not, online. Along with all of the primary sources and secondary sources that are being indexed and cataloged. So there's um, a number of different features of these databases that we uh, intend to include in, in this um, ontology. So cuneiform tablets are inherently multidimensional artifacts. They consist of six sides with inscriptions and other human artifacts pressed into the wet clay upon their creation. That may include thumbprints or uh, erasures, uh, and um, they may be wrapped in a clay envelope uh, and sealed with a cylinder seal uh, pressed, uh, rolled across the top. But um, scholars have come up with a number of uh, conventions to denote each of these features found on a cuneiform tablet in their publications. So a lot of this has been published over the last <clears throat> century in different formats, uh, which is both helpful and uh, poses a challenge for, the, for our ontological models of linking all of these different elements to the artifacts as they exist. Um, currently, the fact-graded ontology includes these main entity types, um, such as the um, attributes of the tablet itself, its size and shape, uh, along with the named, major named entities on the tablet. So personal names um, and the kind of roles and activities that these named entities have, along with any toponyms or ancient place names and um, chronological designations of time period. Um, we're also working to link uh, all of the primary and secondary publications around uh, or that are cited, citing a specific tablet. But um, a component that will probably, that, that we're working on extending now is what I'm highlighting here in red, the lexicographical documentation. So really getting down to what I said, the each sign is the and the epigraphy and the way these signs are, are written. So cuneiform data uh, exists in many forms. Um, we see here four different types um, the photos of the tablet that um, we have over um, I think 200,000 2D images in, in the databases along with more recently, uh, 3D images are being created. Um, transliterations are the scholarly readings of the sign, which are a convention that employs epigraphical notations, um, the way the signs look on the surface, along with the morphological, phonological, uh, and phonetic readings of the signs for a given corpus and time period. The lemmatization is employed in the databases through um, what's called an ASCII transliteration format. So it's kind of a TEI way of, of encoding the different linguistic features in a notation in, in a string. Uh, and then each tablet is also a record of different actions, events, and actors. So recent scholarship um, has focused on these entities and their relationships in order to restore the ancient social networks and perform some preliminary demographic analysis. The task at hand is to define an ontology for each dimension of data that can be linked to a tablet. So we're trying to create a foundation where all of these can be found uh, and or linked to the, the artifact as such. So the lexical dimension is one of the most comprehensive in the databases. So it consists of a romanized reading of the sign, uh, the form, uh, which is the lemma, is it's found in the lexicon, the sense of the word or its basic meaning of, of the lemma, uh, the morphology, which includes some basic part of speech tags, and uh, metadata for the language, provenience, period, um, and, and other aspects of the, the language there. And then the uh, named entities are also being articulated. So 
personal names, royal names, geographic names. Um, these are, you can see that there's not any research um, currently around um, syntax, except for the work of Emily Page Perron, who's working with on a project to, to do some tree banking or universal dependencies for Sumerian. But there are um, at least, you know, 20 different languages that are employing cuneiform. <laughs> so most of them are not represented in um, Wikidata yet really in a, any robust way or in, in Google for that matter. So these are really uh, under um, underdeveloped um, ancient dead languages. So there's a lot of work to be done still. But we are using the Ontolex Lemon um, lexicography module W3C standards to make sure that this can all these these triples can all be um, implemented in RDF and um, linked data. So the, this component is the artifact properties have not yet been fully described in, in ontology. So this has been my primary focus for the last year and a half uh, or, or more, really like um, more like 10 years. But um, I've fortunately been able to find a number of colleagues that are helping and interested and eager to take up this, this issue. Um, the challenge is that it's not always clear how a sign on a tablet should be linked to a Unicode equivalent, for example. So you can see here that um, we have, you know, the tablet photo, which may or may not have legible signs. Uh, then we have a lot of um, line art that where a scholar has um, made a transmission of the of the signs in in a way for them to tr um, to read the tablet a little better. Um, this usually reflects the scholar's hand uh, more so than the the tablet um, directly. Um, and you can see that there are um, conventions for shading and marking um, breaking in the tablet breaks and lines um, that were made originally by the scribes of the tablets. So there's a lot of scholarly convention that gets encoded in this, including line numbers. Um, and um, so there's, there's kind of a, a, an extra step involved in connecting these different types of data to a, a given Unicode sign. And that especially is challenging um, considering there's 4,000 years of written history here. So if we're looking at say a, a text like this, which is published um, uh, at the University of Chicago, a, a, a syllabary that was made in which we have um, a list of Sumerian uh, lemmas uh, and with that, a gloss of Akkadian uh, equivalents. So two languages, both using cuneiform, one uh, a language isolate and the other one a Semitic language. Um, scholars have then provided the, you know, these transliterations of the signs themselves. Um, and then a normalization of that uh, along with um, a translation. And then of course, the commentaries, you know, the citations and cross references and, and notes on, on each line uh, often. So this is, you know, with about a century of scholarship uh, to this level of detail for, for many of the tablets, there's there's a lot that's embedded in in um, analog data still, and so the digitization process is still underway. Um, but our ontological model has to reach all of these um, details in order to include the a massive amount of scholarship that's gone on in the field of Assyriology around each of these little tablets. Um, so. Um, in order to keep track of these different readings for a given sign, um, I built a sign list during my PhD research that attempted to collect the different readings during each, and for each period. So each of these columns corresponds to uh, a certain period in time in which uh, this sign was read. And, and that reading is kind of a, 
a, a, a mix between the phonological understanding of uh, our, of the sign as well as the kind of phonetic value. But of course, these are dead languages. So these are scholars, scholars kind of best guess uh, as well. Um, so this sign list kind of um, became uh, a bit of a wiki uh, data set that I've shared with a new number of scholars over the years. Um, but it's <clears throat> become a critical data set for linking the various uh, readings of a sign to its Unicode code point over um, the 4,000 years of, of written history. And um, this kind of work is um, taking, um, taking hold in a lot of the um, uh, you, uh, open source sign lists for cuneiform. So um, I've been lucky enough to find a very talented computer science engineer, um, Timo Holmberg, who's working on a cuneiform ontology for linking these different types of data. Um, and um, he's writing his, his, this work for his PhD dissertation uh, at, the, at Mainz um, University where we're collaborating to implement his work into the existing databases, including the CDLI, Cuneiform Digital Library Initiative. So there's um, a kind of ontological model that's again linked to Ontolex Lemon uh, that, that addresses the glyph variation, uh, as well as the sign etymology and sign similarity um, over time. So the, these ontological models are um, still being developed, I mean, as we speak, but um, we're hoping to get this accomplished this year. I, I think it's not too ambitious. Uh, so Timo has also developed an encoding method for sign variation called paleocodage, which can account for any slight variation in the epigraphy. So if the sign is slightly diagonal, instead of horizontal, then that can be noted in a kind of code that is machine readable. So then that allows us to use machine learning for to detect and, and to, to annotate slight variation in the glyphs in, in, in the signs themselves. This is a, a really cool, uh, I think, application of, of um, computer, you know, machine learning to, to help the extreme amount of variation we find in these signs. And um, even cooler, the, this, these types of annotations are now being crowdsourced. So um, Timo and his advisor, Hubert Mara at Mainz have implemented these tools in a apl application, one for lay people and one for seriology scholars <laughs> or students where they can on their phone uh, kind of annotate or, or suggest if this sign corresponds to this reading and um, make uh, additional comments about the, the shape and, and um, the gestalt uh, characteristics of the sign. That, uh, that includes um, for, for the character, for the wedge and the word, um, all of these components can be um, annotated in this web app. Um, so far, they have about 1,600 tablets scanned in 3D and 3D models that they're using um, for the image segmentation and annotation with a series of questions as to whether or not these, um, the, the links that they've drawn are, ac are accurate. And, um, and if not, then you can input new data into the, into the app. They currently have 30,000 annotations um, for, for these tablets. So if we were to project what that would mean, uh, implementing them for the 350,000 tablets for somewhere in the seven, range of 7 million annotations, that's probably a conservative estimate. But um, yeah, it's, it's one that we have to think about in terms of creating um, URIs for signs. Uh, <laughs> The um, overarching goal has, is that the cuneiform um, will ultimately have an optical character recognition software behind it so that, you know, um, let's say tablets are, are being 
taken out of the country and it, they're they're captured in um you know a checkpoint and and they take photos of the tablets then those photos can be um ocr'd um to see what period these tablets are from you know time period and language and and to give um real historical characteristics to what might be mislabeled as turkish tiles you know that's kind of happened in the past uh, in the in the near recent present future even <laughs> so um so this is software that that is already able to recognize to some degree uh, the signs but there's uh, so much complexity that that it really can't get beyond um certain characteristics so and it does so by measuring the depth of the um of the triangles in the 3D mesh. Um, obviously, we need more data. We'll continue to scan these tablets in 3D, um, that, which is no small feat. But also, we need um, a linked data model to, to link all of these different characteristics of the tablet together. Um, OK, so in kind of in conclusion, um, even though a lot of what I've spoken about is perhaps more geared towards the computer science and engineering components of, of the, the data around tablets, it's still very clear that this is a need in the seriology community. Um, and um, the um, just as they've noted here back in 1978, um, the grammatical and philological analysis constitutes a methodological masonry, what they use to construct the meaning uh, in historical meaning. Um, and the historian lays the foundation for his historical theory on the basis of, of these very minute little readings of the signs. So if the foundation's faultily constructed, the superstructure will be in constant danger of collapsing. So this is, something that I think most philologists uh, are cognizant of, which is why it's so critical that the ontology includes this level of detail, why we're getting into the weeds here with different readings of different signs for, for different periods, is that um, you can see it here, you know, this is uh, Marvin's talking about the reading of the sign Tak, uh, Taka or Tak 4. And yes, there is a talk three, talk two, and talk one. <laughs> Although they're not, um, they're kind of more historical values that scholars used. But he's commenting here about another scholar who translated this sign as to send, which he finds no proof for. So that in and of itself is a really interesting kind of kind of conundrum. How how these signs gain meaning in translation sometimes has to do with uh, scholars' authority more so than the actual etymology and sense of the signs themselves. So all of this has to be uh, encoded properly. And ideally, these references would be linked to the sign talk so that future scholars don't confuse uh, Mark Cohen's translation with talk four. And um, thanks to Marvin Powell's um, discussion on that one sign. <laughs> Okay, um, so so all of this is to some degree going to get included in um, this fact grid cuneiform project. Um, but for the signs and their variants, we will most likely need to look at a federated wiki base or elsewhere to store the triples at the sign level uh, with the annotations, which will be in the hundreds of millions, no doubt. So that's going to have to be dealt with differently. But by and large, the main kind of entity types of the tablet um, what can be included here and linked in Wikidata. Um, so I think that wraps things up. If you, thanks for your patience. If you're interested in hearing more, um, I've recently published some of the rationale for this work uh, in this book, um, Digital Context of At-Risk Textual Archives. Uh, you can contact me th via GitHub. Um, or GitLab, I have to keep the same kind of cryptic uh, handle here, my name minus most of the vowels. Um, if you'd like to join in this work, please reach out to me. You're more than welcome. This is all open source data um, and I'm 
I love to share. So please don't hesitate to contact me, adamganderson at gmail.com. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Hey, hey Adam, can I, before you go away, I have a question for you. Awesome. Um, <laughs> so the, the spreadsheet that you showed that had, you know, that was pulling together sort of a, a whole series of data. Um, I, I, maybe I'm wrong, but I imagine that there are a number of people in your position that are doing similar things that have like their own version of this. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, to some degree, there, there's, um, I like they're different. So you can see here on this left hand side, I'm, I, so I'm already hearing column E and before E there, you know, there are a number of sign lists that are giving numeric values to these signs over the years. So OBO was published, I think in the 2000s, Labatt was published in the 60s and 70s, Borger, same thing. Uh, so these are sign lists that are in common use um, for the broadest repertoire of signs for cuneiform, but for every period, so let's say like Old Babylonian Sumerian, you can make a sign list just for those with, that has annotations and commentary. And a lot of these have been published. So there's probably a hundred published sign lists that correspond to different time periods that then have like commentary and annotations. Now, of course, like you said, uh, individual scholars are doing this work as well. Um, we're, we're linking this to two existing um, pu open published side lists. One that's through Wikipedia, that's actually pretty comprehensive. And another one that was developed by um, some scholars in Helsinki. But yeah, I mean, like the idea is that we're trying to create kind of a toolkit, a natural language toolkit for cuneiform. Uh, and cuneiform is a writing system that encapsulates multiple languages. And so we want to mainly just make this as all encompassing as possible and then encourage scholars who are able to uh, commit, you know, changes and things in, in, in a GitHub repository, basically. But that's very true. Like, I mean, just like a database, you know, I think every graduate student I know nowadays is making their own database, but we're primarily working with the main kind of hubs. And then the idea would be that these um, these other kind of like discrete databases that people make in a FileMaker file or or in on their website can get linked together at some point, um, or you know, or that they'll do that work themselves. But but yeah, like I think we're we're mainly looking at like the main actors and hubs to try to say here, let's make a, a toolkit for for the for the writing system that could then be uh, applied to these different languages using the writing system a lot of that work is is just still in its infancy uh, to be honest and there aren't that many scholars uh, in Assyriology who are confident uh, working in github for example um, and so we're trying to use the existing hubs of databases that they know about to link all of this and make it kind of clear with some documentation about how these vocabularies and ontologies and standards help uh, help in this process of linking the data. Okay, I have two follow-ups, but first I want to address, uh, there was a request that um, you drop the GitHub project link in the chat so that people can, can grab it if that's possible. Okay, yeah, um, there's, yeah, totally. I'll, in fact, uh, maybe I can just um, share the, uh, the slides share oh, yeah, I have yeah. a lot is of it? github links like this this is a github to the cuneiform ontology that that timo created mm -hmm. there's there's a github um like you know i have my github but there are githubs for it, it, that's the other challenge like a lot of the githubs are yes are getting uh <laughs> other repositories are going to get kind of included into the cdli's github since that's mm -hmm. like i think the major hub um, for for what's being developed right now. Um, but so yeah. you can you can either send you send your link or if you send your um, presentation to me, I can post it or you can post it on Sked as well. And people can get it there. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll send I'll send you the link to the to the slides. That that should probably be the easiest yeah. way. Um, um, 
And then can I distract you with two follow-ups about your spreadsheet? Oh yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Could, could you could you give us an idea of how like the how big that spreadsheet is? Like how many how many rows is this thing mm. gonna have? Like yeah, five hundred twenty thousand. <laughs> oh, okay. So there's fifteen hundred more or less fifteen hundred signs, uh, okay. form signs, um, and so. So there'll be 1500 rows. <laughs> I mean, you know, the some of these, you know, some of these signs are ligatures, like so you can see here, two signs create uh, the, uh, another sign. So so Iggy and Dub make this sign Agrig, which um, so so the so some of them are kind of compound logograms uh, or um, or they're they're written, um, you know, in in kind of internally. So in this case, you have he, and then there's a nun written in the middle of it. So, so the signs themselves are are sometimes like composites of each other, and and so, but this has already been established in most of the sign lists, and so yeah, these standard sign lists, Labat and Borger, oops, um, they have by and large, like covered the majority of the signs for a seriology. Now there are many more signs that have yet to be encoded even um, that are from uh, the early Iranian uh, cuneiform. Those are called proto-Elamite uh, signs. And, and those exist in other sign lists, like, but only as numbers. We don't know the readings sometimes for those. Um, so, and then of course there's the old Persian signs. So cuneiform has a, a large history and um, what I'm, what we're dealing with at least initially are uh, those that we have, I think the most data for that falls into um, Sumerian cuneiform signs, the signs that the Sumerians kind of created and then the Akkadians and Babylonians and Hittites um, and, and many other culture, language cultures used and utilized as a lingua franca uh, during the first millennium and earlier from the third to the first millennium BC. Okay, so so there's lots and lots of uh, columns that correspond to these different periods in, in readings. <laughs> um, so, but the, the number of signs for the, at least the Sumerian signs are only 1500. If we look at like the proto-Elamite signs, then that's like probably double that number, I'd guess. And so are these 1500, are the, these are the ones that they're sort of, they have an accepted um, meaning or like how much would this data change? Because I, I can imagine like if there are multiple people with spreadsheets like this and all of the columns reaching across, the idea of trying to keep that synced with something else seems like just nightmare material. Yeah, yeah, it, it's a challenge. The I'd say like the you can see that a lot of the readings here I obtained from ORAC. So that's a database that created a global sign list within their database. Um, so a lot of those readings, you know, I think are accepted and agreed upon. Um, the meanings are, are are more or less set. I mean, there's discrepancies, no doubt. Um, but then you have what's going on um, in this column, for example, that's like wildly different than what we're seeing here, uh, is that they're taking the old Babylonian Sumerian literary text, so like a, a genre of, of literature that's, that's taking place, and they are identifying uh, current readings and they're noting um, old readings that are to be, uh, that are to be outdated, uh, but that are still found in publication. So that's the other nightmare about this is that, you know, in the in the 1850s when cuneiform was just being published, uh, they were giving readings and publishing readings of signs that we no longer use today as scholars. Like so it was an attempt at a decipherment of a phonetic value from a dead language. So how close can you get? I mean like so there was a lot of discrepancy in these early uh, readings so that instead of T8 now it's no, we're going to call it Tay eight. So and, you know, <laughs> subtle differences, uh, but there's you know they're noting all of this, um, 
I think. Um, and so it, at least for, for corpus, in this case, seen the Sumerian literature, they don't want T8. However, T8 is still a valid reading if you're reading um, Sumerian, you know, probably administrative texts from Lagash during the early dynastic two period, so like 2500 BC. So, so these readings change uh, for a given corpus that's situated in a place and time or a genre. Uh, and, and so, and then of course, there are new readings that scholars are coming up with, at least the scholars that are really interested in this, the idea of, uh, of capturing the phonetics of the language. Again, this is a dead language. How are you going to find the phonetics of a dead language? We're going to do it through these syllabaries, for example, that I was uh, pointing to here. For You can see that, that they'll see a Sumerian string of signs, and then they'll see the Akkadian uh, syllabic values for, for, the, for that Sumerian word uh, or, or words. And then they'll say, OK, this is, this is how the Sumerians you know, are making this. And, and they'll see it in sequence here. And so they'll try to intuit what the, what the phonetic value is. Now, of course, the Sumerians, they were, they were implementing uh, oplouts and umlauts and all these different kind of vowel uh, you know, utterances. Um, that's very evident from the amount of variation we have from their vowel system, but we don't know for sure because it was a dead language already at 2000 BC. So, so there were no living uh, tongues of Sumerian, uh, speakers of Sumerian. And all we have it is through this transmission process, which is why it's still giving birth to new phonetic kind of guesses, let's say, based on uh, texts like this that are providing a kind of template for how it might, how a sign might be uttered. Um, so that kind of work, it really enrages a lot of scholars who just want to work with the base unit of the sign, almost kind of a computational encoding, just for translation and transliteration purposes. But there are this group of scholars working with uh, an attempt at a phonetic value of the sign, and they'll continue to come up with new readings uh, every year, basically. <laughs> So it really depends on which kind of school of thought you belong to in the field of Assyriology, whether you just want to stick with a basic sign reading, sign name, and its basic meaning, or if you're kind of pushing for the closest phonetic utterance of the language, which is very difficult to assert uh, with any real authority, considering that all of the ancient native speakers are gone. Um, and there are no language, uh, you know, uh, it's a, it was a language isolate. So there are no language families even or, or related sister languages or anything that we could say, oh, well, you know, like, like for ancient Hebrew, you know, which was used to some degree to reconstruct modern Hebrew, you could say, great, we got Yiddish, we got Arabic and Aramaic, and we can look at those and reconstruct something that might be phonetically similar to the, the biblical Hebrew. Yeah, you can't do that for Sumerian. You have to just look at what is uh, available textually in these ancient syllabaries and, and equivalencies that the other cultures were making. So yeah, it, it's it's a challenge, but but at least uh, in the end, there's you know a finite number of signs. There is an infinite number of readings for those signs, maybe <laughs> like somewhat infinite, but but. Um, you know, I think that that's why we have to build something that is also expandable and, and you know, can continue to collect the scholarship because it's ongoing. Like, a, you know, a reading, a new reading for a given sign, for an old sign, you know, comes with every new tablet. And there are new tablets coming out of the ground every C excavation period. So, so it's, it, even though it's, you know, these are all dead ancient cultures, some, some of the data is coming out is, is technically brand new, right? Like, and the only people that have seen it were dead 4,000 years ago. And so that's the other kind of interesting dimension of this field is that it's on, you know, so different from say like, you know, manuscripts that have been curated and edited by, you know, the medieval scribes and, and monks and rabbis that some of this stuff has never has seen an editor until today and then it's you know it's put in a museum it's it published uh, you know in a collection 
And scholars will then come up with new readings that way too. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a bizarre field in that regard, um, but really something where linked data is clearly necessary <laughs> to make sense of it all. Yeah, well, it's, I mean, it's cool to have sort of an approachable introduction to something that feels really unapproachable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, and we're and we're we're kind of finally getting like I think a constituent group together to just define kind of standards and, and vocabularies and ontologies in open source venues like GitHub and you know Zenodo and 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 Wikibase and FactGrid and 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 uh, Wikidata. So I think that that movement's growing and and what's on wikipedia is getting better and better uh whereas initially it was like scholars were very dismissive of it i think it's really becoming a go-to for for a lot of like general knowledge in the field so that's really inspiring because i think that you have to find a hub of where you can contribute meaningfully and where you know the majority of people who don't know about Assyriology can go and i think that that is really circling around um, the main kind of linked data uh, hubs like Wikidata and, and, um, and Wikipedia. So that's that's why I'm doubling down into this like sphere because I think that it's where we can make the biggest impact. If there are any other questions, feel free to use the q and I think some folks maybe had a hard time with the chat, um, but Q&A is another option at the bottom of your Zoom menu. Yeah, one of the, one of the kind of, I mean, there are a lot of outcomes here um, while we're waiting for a question. I can say like one of the main kind of things that spurred me into this was um, that, you know, um, Back around the the Arab Spring in 2014, there were there were a number of uh, institutions in the United States that kind of were outed for holding um, cuneiform tablets in their collections from Iraq that should be repatriated. And there was the Bible and Museum from Hobby Lobby that, where they paid uh, you know 1.6 million dollars for a collection of tablets. Um, and those those need had to be quickly photographed and repatriated. It turns out they were um, excavated illegally by ISIS, uh, and so so a lot of this is still going on. It's thoroughly enmeshed in like the the challenges, the geopolitical challenges in the Middle East, and I think that you know this is also data that is endangered. Like there's um, a new dam going up in um, in Syria that, that will endanger the site of Ashur. Well, that was the imperial hub, you know, in the in, in the first through third, for third millennia BC. Uh, and it's only been excavated for the first millennium. The second and third millennium that exist at Ashur are still underground. So that means if, if a dam goes and, and floods this, then we've lost two millennia of, of written history, and and I'm I'm personally would project there to be, you know, at least a million tablets under that site. Like, you know, I don't think that's too big of a number. So so it's it's like, and that's just tablets. Like, there's a lot of material culture it, at these sites that are in constant danger. Um, so I think that you know the the better we can kind of work with the data that we have to define how all this is going to come together, uh, the more we can meaningfully connect it when, if and when uh, the, these sites get excavated, well, whether it's illicit digging or um, official, you know, uh, excavation. Okay, well, thank you so much, Adam. Thank this you. Fascinating. Um, I want to make sure we end on time so everyone can get to the last session of the conference. Um, have a great day and thanks again. Thank you.